pretty important. Yep. And then I will switch to the last lecture that shouldn't be too long. So, yeah, so we're there. And so, yeah, we took the, the example of this experiment. I know if you remember, but for instance, the, the value of the, Renault, the, Rayleigh, the um, Reynolds number in this experiment, uh, uh, in the um, geophysical system we're looking at, was about 10 to the minus 6. If you compute the equivalent uh, Reynolds number in this experiment, you find something which is always larger than 0 0.01. Um, so this is just one example to say that it's often really hard to reach exactly the dimensionless numbers of the Earth, and that's why we need scaling laws. Because that's how you, you can extrapolate your experiment or your simulations to the Earth. So um, to illustrate that point, I'm going to take the example of um, the cooling of a magma ocean uh, in terms of orders of magnitude. So if you wanted to know what is a time scale for the cooling of a fully liquid magma ocean, so the, the, the one which is not very viscous. So first I'm going to m model that by a very simple system. So I'm going to take a classical rayleigh Benard problem where um, we have a hot temperature at the bottom and a cold temperature at the top. And so you can have convective motion if the temperature difference is uh, large enough. So then the question that we ask is, um, what is in that case the heat flux that go away from this system? Because if we can estimate the heat flux, then we will be able to say something about the cooling rate of the magma ocean. So the temperature in that kind of system, the temperature um, when you have relay numbers that are large enough, the temperature will, be, will have that shape, so it will be more or less uniform, in, or at least the hypothesis that we are making, more or less u uniform in the bulk, and you have boundary layered at the bottom and the top where the temperature varies a lot. And that's uh, basically um, where you will have um, diffusive heat flux that you, can, uh, that you are going to measure in your experiment. And so, um, yeah, so now if you apply the method that we, we used this morning, and dimensional analysis, so you apply the Pi theorem to, um, uh, to this system, you find that your system can be described by two dimensionless numbers, the Rayleigh number that we already saw this morning, which is a ratio of the diffusion, two diffusion times divided by the advection time squared. Um, and it, you can write it like that. And then the parental number, which is just a ratio of diffusivity, diffusion of momentum uh, to diffusion of temperature. And then what we are looking for is what we call the Nusselt number, which is just your heat flux, Q, divided by, by the heat flux if you had only uh, thermal conduction through the layer. So uh, here it's, you can re write it like that, but it's just a way to normalize the, um, the heat flux that you can measure in your experiments. And yeah, so to make my point, as I was saying earlier, so the Rayleigh number for fully liquid magma ocean, uh, you can estimate it. It's really high, 10 to the power 27, so extremely high. There is no way you can reach that in experiments or simulations nowadays. And so that's why, uh, that's when you, you need scaling laws to know what your heat flux will be. Um, and so the game is to try to find a scaling law for the Nusselt number as a function of the Rayleigh number and the parental number to know uh, what, what is the, the, self the Nusselt number at the, value of the um, at the value of the real number in the magma ocean. Uh, so what can we do about that? Uh, so first, um, from, oh, actually I should, yeah, I can switch. So you can do experiments. So those are quite classical Rayleigh Binar cl um, convection experiments that have been done uh, in the 80s. And basically they found um, a scaling laws with a Nusselt number as a relay to the one-third. And so that's nice because you have a scaling law now, <laughs> uh, and it seems to be work quite well with the experiment. So can we, f before I go any further, can we understand um, theoretically what that scaling law means? And I think it's interesting actually to see that because the reasoning can be applied to different systems. Um, so have you heard um, about the, 
the onset of convection before, so you all know that, so basically when the, for the convection to start, you need the Rayleigh number to be high enough, meaning that you need buoyancy to be strong enough so that it can overcome diffusion of temperature and viscosity. So there will be a critical Rayleigh number where convection will start. Okay, so this is H. And if I come back to the assumption I made, so I made that the temperature, I, uh, I made the assumption that the temperature in this layer evolves like that. So it's uniform in the bulk, but you have boundary layers where you have a sharp gradient. And so your heat flux, Q, will basically um, be related to what happens here. So it will be proportional to um, uh, that, where delta is a thickness of this layer. So it's really delta, the thickness of this layer, that will going to determine the, the heat flux. And delta is a, an output parameter, right? It's really the, it's an output parameter from the convection. It's not something you know by default. So the question is, how is delta going to evolve? And um, so one way to um, see that problem is to say, well, we could say that the boundary layers are basically uh, layers where the temperature diffusive and diffuses until convection set up. And so then when convection set up, you have plume that rises. And so the boundary layer should be at the onset of convection, meaning that um, if I define the Rayleigh number of at the scale of the boundary layer, should write like that. And this should be equal to your critical Rayleigh number. Uh, for instance, this is approximately um, 850 uh, something or 658 for um, Rayleigh Binar convection with uh, free slip boundary conditions. But anyway, it's a, it's a fixed value. And so now if you rearrange this expression and you put all of that in this, on this side of this equation, you, you find basically that delta over H to the third is going to be proportional to um, your critical Rayleigh number times one over the Rayleigh number of the system. And so you directly find that delta over H should evolve as the Rayleigh number to the minus one third. Okay, so now we are almost there. You start the, uh, to see the one third upper appearing. Um, come back to there. So if you come back to the definition of Nusselt number, so the Nusselt number by definition was this divided by the conductive influx, which is just that. And so now uh, you see that you are left with delta over H. Uh, no, the, the opposite, actually. H um, over delta. And so now you get that the Nusselt number should vary as a Rayleigh number to the one third. So it's quite nice because now you see that you get a result which um, is quite close to what is expected in the experiments. And that's uh, a good illustration of the approach that we take when you want to extrapolate a result to the years. Like you need a, to have experiment, like scaling laws in experiments or simulations, but it's also nice when you have s some theoretical understanding of it so that you are confident that you can extrapolate it. Okay, so let's do that for my motion. Oh yeah, and as you say here, you, you can see that the value of the red number in those experiments is like 10 to the 12. So very small, I mean much smaller, orders of magnitude smaller than the, the Rayleigh number in the mag motion we're interested in. But since now we have some confidence that our scaling makes sense, uh, we can extrapolate it. And if you do that, you find, an, uh, you find a new cell number of 10 to the, uh, to the power 8, which gives you a flux of 10 to the power 5 watts per meter squared. And if you convert this in terms of time scale, cooling time scale, you find a time scale of uh, 1,000 years. Uh, so the time scale, the cooling time scale for a fully liquid mag motion is of the order of 1,000 years. So it's really quick. 
And that's making one big assumption is that there is no uh, atmosphere, like no dense atmosphere around the Earth. Because um, actually um, a number of teams or groups, especially in Japan, have shown that if you have a dense atmosphere, uh, you could, that could isolate, I mean, do uh, some kind of thermal isolation and you could maintain your magma ocean for perhaps 100 million years. But most likely still, even with that, the, the, the stage of the for the fully liquid magma ocean is probably of 1,000 years. It could be maintained much more like for the more like viscous magma ocean we talked earlier this morning, but the, the fully liquid magma ocean is going to disappear in 1,000 years. So it's really quick. Uh, okay, so perhaps I will just pass by on that. Um, yeah, self-similarity. It's a pity you won't hear about salamander. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so the conclusion, I guess I can still, the conclusion on this uh, lecture I wanted to emphasize is basically dimensional analysis is really useful when you study the free dynamics of the deep earth. Um, it's really important if you want to understand the, the flow morphology and the dynamical regi regime. Um, it's really important if you want to scale down analog experiments. Um, it's really important if you want to find analytical self-similar solution, which I didn't have time to show you, but it will be on the slide. And it's really important if you want to extrapolate scaling laws to the deep earth. So now we can switch to um, the third lecture, which will be more like a seminar um, style. So I'm just going to show you some of my research projects, basically. Um, So it's going to be a little bit faster, perhaps, for our compared to um, the previous lectures, or perhaps a bit more complicated, I guess. So it might be for master students, it might be a bit more complicated. So don't feel, uh, don't stress out if you don't understand everything. It's just normal, probably. It's more like a research seminar. Um, but it's a research seminar, but really in continuation to, um, uh, to what I've just talked about. So you will see there will be some material coming back, but um, but new, uh, I mean, uh, not not for the results section. So I'm going to talk about um, projects that I've been working um, on with um, a number of people. Uh, I started to work on this topic with Peter Olson and Renan Deguin, where I did so. I did a first postdoc in Johns Hopkins in the U.S. and um, also so now since I'm since I'm in Cambridge for, so I've been in Cambridge for two years, so I'm uh, working essentially with Stuart Deliel and Jerome Neufeld there. And so um, those two projects are on the free dynamics of impact. As you understood, I quite like the free dynamics of impact. And uh, it will be an, uh, to, s to show you, to demonstrate how those are important to understand first mixing between metal and silicates but also uh, stratification after impact. So it's something I haven't talked about yet. So if you remember, um, the stages of accretion uh, from the nebula to the planetary um, sized planets. So here we are going to look at really the late stage of Earth's accretion. So the accretion by large impact, which is probably where the Earth accreted much of its mass. And so again, this is quite important because those are the, la the latest events of Earth's accretion and the largest events of Earth's accretion. So they play probably a really big role to determine the initial temperature and composition um, of the Earth. So as I said earlier, large impact is a free dynamics problem because when you have an impact, you induce shock waves, the shock waves melt the impactor and the proto -earth, you form a magma ocean, and so you can really look at those processes from a fluid mechanics point of view. And we saw already the liquid core is, really, is going to be released in the magma ocean. And so the first part of this talk will be on metal silicate equilibration and mixing during this stage. So we heard, I mean, I talked about it this morning, but you will see there are still aspects that we don't fully understand. And the second part of this talk will be this time focusing on the largest of those impacts, the giant impacts, that are large enough so that you melt the entire portion of the mantle below the impact. And in this case, the core of the impactor will migrate in the liquid magma ocean and merge directly with the Earth's core. And that's going to be important to set the stratification in the core. 
So we talk about that in the second part. Okay, so mixing after impact. Um, so you already know why it's important to understand uh, mixing after impact because we want to interpret the geochemical data in terms of the timing of uh, Earth's accretion. So we want to have physical constraints on the degree of chemical equilibration. And so basically, uh, uh, yeah, so again, I come back to this big picture, so we are here. The idea is to uh, try to bring new constraints from, from a fluid mechanics point of view. So you saw all of that. And you already all know all of that. But, so, in all I, um, yeah, I can summarize what I talked about this morning. So this morning, we saw that um, it's important to understand those processes because you can have very turbulent condition, you form droplets, if you form metal droplets, you are going to have chemical exchanges. And we saw that it's quite an early topic, a young topic, but um, there are simulations that show that um, you can have, you will form a rain of iron in the magma ocean. More recent uh, experiments demonstrated that, uh, that actually you form more a plume of droplets rather than a rain of droplets. But in all those studies, we make a very rough assumption. We assume that the initial velocity of the impact of core is zero. So that means that we entirely neglect the inertia of the impactor here. So what is the effect of the impact velocity or the on the mixing between metal and silicates? So that's the question uh, we are asking here. Especially, um, it's an imp especially important question because if you go on impact craters, uh, for instance, like meteor crater on Earth um, here, you, you observe, I mean, geologi geologists observe that the impactor has been fragmented all over the place. So there have been some mixing in those events. So what is the amount of mixing when you go to really large impacts like that? So that's the, the question we wanted to answer. So as you know, numerical simulation cannot really answer this, uh, this question because they will resolve a uh, length scale of about 100 kilometers only. And so you need experiments. And so what I'm going to uh, argue in, in this talk is that basically uh, impacts of a drop with another liquid are good analogs for the impacts that form the Earth. So you probably, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really just saying that, you know, when you, you have a drop and you release it in water, you have uh, some kind of splash. So you actually almost see it when I, if I do that from far away, hopefully I won't spit water on you everywhere. You actually, uh, um, I don't know if you see it, but you actually see that there is uh, some splash that goes quite high. And so I'm just saying that those impacts are good analog for the large impacts that form the Earth or at least that the, 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 the path we are taking. There is still a big difference between those drop impacts, so when I take a drop and I release it in, in my cup like that, um, and the difference is that when I do that, surface tension is very important, uh, but as we saw this morning, in those impacts, surface tension is negligible, so how do you treat that correctly? And for that, for to for surface tension to be small enough, you need the impactor to be uh, big, enough, basically, uh, in terms of order of magnitude, you, you need a few centimeters, an impactor of more than five, five centimeters. But that's not completely easy, because when you, when you have a drop, it's easy to make it spherical, because surface tension helps you, but when you have a blob of six centimeter, how do you keep it spherical? Um, so the trick is to put it in a balloon, so literally it's a water balloon, the one that kids uh, throw, you know, to themselves. And so you put it in a water balloon, uh, you put a needle above the water pool, and you let the balloon fall into the needle. And so the, when the balloon falls in the needle, the membrane retracts and you release your blob, which impacts the water. And so here we want to measure mixing. Okay, dimensionless numbers. So you know all about that. Um, the Reynolds number, which is inertia to viscosity, is really large during those events and both for the Weber number. Impact simulations, you can see for instance in 3D impact simulations, they go to Reynolds number of about 10, at most 100, but just to uh, demonstrate how far away they are from um, these value. In experiment, we can go much higher to much higher value. We are still really far away from the geophysical system. But. However, we are in a regime where inertia 
is large compared to both surface tension and viscosity. So I th we think we are at least in the right di uh, dynamical regime. And then the key parameter, which is going to uh, be the key parameter throughout um, this talk, is what we call, so you can basically now you can forget about the Weber and the Reynolds number. We just made sure that we are in the right dynamical regime. But now the main, key pa the main control parameter is what we call the Trude number, which is a ratio between inertia and gravity. So U is the impact velocity and R the size of the blob. And we uh, basically vary the impact velocity by, by varying the uh, fall height of our blob. And you can see that we can match quite well the values of uh, large impacts for the full number. So here is an example of an experiment. So you see that the blob um, falls, impacts the water, and forms this flash. Um, that and the crater that collapses again. So if I play it again, so you see that here you have the blob with the membrane, but it falls into the needle. So the membrane retracts. You actually see a bit of splash here. It's because the membrane just retracted. So the blob falls more or less spherical, and it forms an, a crater and a splash uh, above the water. And then it retracts. Um, it collapses due to gravity and forms um, a secondary jet here, and you will see that the jet will collapse again due to gravity. Up. Yes. And this dynamics is actually really close morphologically to what you get in simulations. This is an, a, a simulation of uh, an impact with the differentiated bodies, and you see that qualitatively it's, ver it's very similar. However, we do want to check that it's also quantitatively similar because if you look at my impactor here, you see that before the impact, it's not really spherical. I mean, here it starts to be deformed already. It's, it's because, be, uh, because the needle basically deforms uh, a bit the blob. So we want to check that um, this is close enough to be spherical for us to, be to do something quantitative. So to do that, um, we have a th um, there is a theory which is quite uh, nice and easy. So uh, now that you know everything about dimension analysis, I think we can just go through it together because it takes one minute. So basically the assumption is that when you form a crater, so you saw that you for we formed the crater after the impact, and you can measure the, the maximum depth of that crater. So the depth of the crater when it reaches its maximum depth, okay? If you assume that kinetic energy of your impactor, so this is R and the velocity U, if you assume that kinetic energy, um, so how should I write, yeah, so kinetic energy is converted into potential energy, So kinetic energy of the impactor into potential energy in the crater, because you see that here you are going to have air, which is much less dense than the water. So you actually stored potential energy here. So kinetic energy is just uh, one half the mass of the impactor times r cubed in order of magnitude. I could put, a, I mean, here we are really uh, want to scaling low. And potential is energy is going to scale as the density of the water times G, time H. So here we assume that this is an, a hemisphere. So therefore, it will scale as uh, H as H cubed, and times the height, which is H. Well, that's good, because now, so M, you can write it as uh, rho. Um, do I need that? Yes. So actually, that's probably why, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm missing you too. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. And so now it's good because now I'm, um, I have, so I can cancel those two, and uh, I have H4 in that, on that side, which is equal to U squared divided by G, and I divide it, divide it by R4, so to the fourth, so I have one R left here. And so I get that H over R, the dimensionless depth of the crater scale 
as my fruit number, this is my fruit number by definition, to the one fourth. So that's nice because it's quite convenient. Now we can test that in the experiment, and that's a good way to validate our experiment. And that's the results we find. So um, the circles are the data, and the red curve uh, is the fit, and we find an exponent 0 0.24, so really close to one fourth, so that's good. Um, the blue line is a scaling that has been found in numerical simulations of impacts in, planetary, in the planetary sciences community. And here it's important to emphasize that they assume an impact between two solid bodies. But you can see that their scaling fits actually reasonably well to our experimental data. So that means that in our experiments, we can reproduce really well the process of impact, um, of large impact. And the reason for that is because when you have really large impact, the strength of the material doesn't matter so much because the pressures of the impact are really much higher than the strength of the material. And so you can really model this process as a spin mechanic process. And most of the impacts that we see on, um, on planet, the surface of planets uh, or on the moon are actually in this regime where um, gravity is much larger than um, the yield stress. And so um, for most of these impacts, the yield stress doesn't matter, at least for the largest one, for when they are more than uh, a few hundred meters in size. So what about mixing? Because if we remember, we are interested in mixing initially. So here is another uh, film, another movie, where this time we are looking below the crater. And this time, basically, I put fluorescent dye in the impactor. So you will see the reflection at the interface here between the impactor um, and the, the water pool. And I should also say, that you shouldn't, uh, yeah, so everything which is happening here is actually uh, reflections on the water surface. So the dynamics, the relevant dynamics is happening below that line, basically. Everything is just reflection at the surface. So if I play it again. So if you look carefully, you see that you have um, instabilities happening here. And you have wavelengths, like so actually you, are structure, you have structures that are like a mushroom shaped shape um, and that are developing uh, everywhere and that, are m that have more or less the same length here. Um, but the point here is also you can see that um, those structures have a length scale which is much smaller than the size of the system. So you do have turbulent mixing in those experiments. And so that's why we think that we can say something about uh, chemical equilibration. So mixing. So in our experiment, we observe that mixing happens in two different stages. You have, at short times, you have the, 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 the impact-dominated stage that we just saw. But at long time, so something I haven't mentioned is that the blob I release is actually denser than the water pool because I want to model the metal phase. So this is going to be l denser than the water and that we put dye in it so that we can follow the mixing between those two. And so on the long time scale, because it's denser, you form a plume of material that sinks into the water. And so this plume reminds you what you, you have seen this morning, right? So you form a turbulent plume of material that goes down into the magma ocean. And so you can, we know how to describe that dynamics already. Um, I talked about it uh, a bit this morning. I didn't have time actually to do go through the the, the theoretical model, but we do have a theoretical model that describes the dynamics of this plume. However, in this theoretical model, so we find that the degree of mixing, therefore the degree of chemical equilibration, depends on the magma ocean depth, but also on the initial size of our plume, of our cloud. So here, uh, basically, it will depend on the initial size of the plume. But the initial size of the plume depends on what happens during the impact dominated stage. And now if you look, so here you, are, you look at an experiment at quite low prune number, so low impact velocity. 
Now, if I show an experiment at a much higher impact velocity, you see that the initial cloud is much larger. And so the full number really affects this parameter. And so it will affect the final amount of mixing. So the question is, can we predict the evolution of um, the amount of mixing as a function of the full number? So what we did is that we took those images to obtain the total volume that contains dye. Uh, from that, we deduce, oops, sorry, we deduce the initial volume of the release liquid and we, no we normalize by the initial volume. And this gives us a way to quantify mixing. It's a way to quantify the, mix the, 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 the amount of uh, liquid that has been entrained within the, the impactor. And so we do that in all the experiments and we find a scaling law. You see me copying uh, on that one. Uh, we find a scaling law as a function of the full number with an exponent 1.4. So that's nice because now we have a scaling law that gives us the amount of mixing, metal silicate mixing, as a function of the impact velocity and the impact of size. So let's apply that. Something which is important to realize is that the full number is going to be very big for small impacts, but very large for um, uh, very large for small impacts, but very uh, small for uh, large impacts. And the reason is because you see that it has u squared, so u is the impact velocity. The impact velocity is going to vary more or less as the escape velocity, and the escape velocity uh, squared varies as the size of the planet. So the full number varies as the size of the planet divided by the size of the impactor. So the larger the impactor, the smaller the full number. So if you have a Mars size impactor, for instance, you get uh, we predict quite a, so you have a, a low for number and we predict quite a low amount of mixing. But now if you have a much smaller impactor, for instance, 200 kilometer in diameter, you get um, a lot of mixing. So the, the silicate mix is with um, 100 times its volume just during the impact. Okay, nice. So now we can convert that into um, chemical equilibration. Um, so basically using the formalism I introduced this morning. So we inject our new scaling law for the silicate volume in this, scale, in, the, in this expression, and we find the expression of the equilibration as a function of the size of the impactor. Um, and so the red curve is what you get for, if you assume, um, so a partition coefficient of 30 and a magma ocean depth equal to 40% the depth of the mantle. And um, the curve, the dotted curve is the curve I showed you basically this morning. Well, at least from the scaling law I showed you this morning from previous studies, so the Gantel 2014. And you see that now we have um, quite, uh, so we have more mixing and a, n a significant amount of additional mixing, about five times larger than previously, uh, previous models uh, in some region. So it will affect the interpretation of geochemical data. Uh, Philippe asked me this morning if I could plot um, everything uh, I mean, told me that the normalization of the equilibration, chemical equilibration was not very intuitive because I normalized by the maximum um, exchange if there was an infinite uh, amount of silicate. So basically this is what you get if you have, uh, you take the volume of the mantle, you normalize by the volume of the mantle. So here is the maximum. So the, the mass exchange between metal and silicate divided by the mass exchange if the entire core equilibrates with the entire mantle. Uh, that's what you get. So basically, it's similar, um, um, similar conclusion. Okay, so that's it for this part. Any question on that? Yes. Okay. Ah, <laughs> yes, we we think we do now. Yeah. So, yeah, um, so the answer is that it's probably actually um, some kind of transition. Uh, have you, um, have you, you know when you have, um, I, I, heard I talked about plume this morning. So when you have, um, you can have transition between a jet and a plume if you inject some momentum um, and there is a way to quantify where the transition will be happening. So it's something similar to that actually. And we, we do recover an exponent which is close to that. Any other question? Everybody's tired <laughs> and want to do it. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so uh, stratification now. So if you have a really big impact, uh, um, you can mail the entire part of the mantle. And so in this case, you could say, or you expect the impactor core to migrate in the magma ocean, in the fluid ma liquid magma ocean, and say then, then to basically it would stay turbulent until it migrates to the core of the Earth. And so because it stays turbulent, you are going to have, uh, you can have mixing between um, the impactor core and the Earth's core. But this is important because there is no reason for the core of the impactor to be the same as the core of the Earth. So you expect some compositional differences. For instance, if the impactor core is lens dense at the core, it could form a stratified layer at the top of the core, of the Earth's core. And so this is, um, well, the reason why we thought about that is because um, seismic studies, there is very much debate about that, I should say, but some seismic studies uh, observe low P wave velocities at the top um, of the core. In, um, on a um, land scale, on a thickness between 300 to 600, even 800 kilometers in some studies. There is very much debate um, on even the existence of this layer, but if it exists, um, what is the origin of this layer? One um, scenario that has been uh, suggested was that it could be a giant impact, for instance, a moon forming impact that caused that formed this layer, stratified layer at the top of the core. So the idea was can we test this scenario? Okay, so again, simulations, <laughs> just because I like to show movies. So you all know that you can't, with those simulations, you cannot re-answer this question because they don't produce mixing, they don't produce turbulent mixing. Um, but I like to play it again because it's, it's nice to see what happens to the core of the impactor, actually, in those simulations. And you see that it migrates quite uh, rapidly and merges with uh, the core of of the proto -earth. Yeah, but I don't think it means anything in that case. Because, yeah, it does stress stratified because the, the, the material of the impactor core is hotter, so it will stay at the top of the core, I agree. But I don't think you can say anything quantitative with that. It stays stratified, okay, that's all you can say. Because there is no turbulent mixing in there. And so, again, um, we are going to use experiments to, to, to look at this problem. So this time I use a tank with two uh, immiscible layers, silicon oil that represent the magma ocean, and the lower liquid is basically water, um, which represents the proto-core. And we release a liquid, which is a water-based solution that represents the impactor core. So um, the release solution will migrate, oops, that's not what I want to use, will migrate in the upper layer, uh, impacts the lower layer and coalesces with the lower layer. Um, so again, the question is, how much mixing do you get during this process? And what is the final stratification? Dimension is numbers again. So we make sure that the Weber number and the Reynolds number are large enough, as usual, so that we are in the right dynamical regime. And now the two main control parameters are the densi so a density ratio, so this n rho is basically a density ratio that takes a positive value when the release liquid is denser than the lower liquid, but negative values when the, the, the release liquid is less dense than the lower liquid. And then we vary also the depth of, the, um, of our analog magma ocean. So here is a typical experiment. Oops, play it again, it's quite fast. So what you see is that the release liquid impacted, impacts the interface uh, between the two immiscible liquids and it penetrates into the lower liquid and then collapses along the interface. However, here, n rho is positive. So if we, you remember, that means that the release liquid is denser than the lower liquid. So how come this blue liquid collapses back to the interface and doesn't sink into the lower liquid. So the answer um, can be found in pictures of this same uh, experiment. 
Because if you look cl um, closer, you see that, um, for instance, on this picture, you actually see that the liquid in blue here is already a mixture of immiscible liquids. You see drops of oil that have been entrained during this stage. And because the oil here, the upper liquid, is much lighter than the lower liquid, in average, this cloud is less dense than the lower liquid. And that's why it spreads along the interface here. And so the short um, time, at short time, the dynamics is really dominated by the entrainment of oil uh, within the blue cloud here, the release liquid. However, if you wait long enough, the drops of oil will sediment back to the upper layer. And in that case, the dynamics will be dictated by the density of the release liquid. If it's denser, you will form plumes that we call an overturn of the lower liquid, lower layer. But if it's less dense, you are going to form a stratified layer at the top of the lower liquid. So now we know that the what are the different regimes. Let's say, try to say something about stratification. So from those images, we can estimate a characteristic length scale for that layer, which is a stratified layer at the top. Yeah, well I think so. It means that, um, yeah, so uh, that would mean that you can uh, entrain some drops of the magma ocean dimmed uh, into the core. Yes, so uh, incubation at very high pressure and temperature. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So those two liquids are immiscible. They are surface tension. Liquid, liquid silicates are not miscible with liquid iron. They are immiscible. There is surface tension. That's why. This, that's why those two liquids are immiscible, it's because they represent liquid silicates and liquid metals. So <laughs> the impactor core is miscible with the protocore, which makes sense because they're all metal, and, but they're also both immiscible with the silicate, the liquid silicates. And so you do entrain drops of liquid silicates in the core in that scenario. And then they go up, yes. So you can equilibrate at basically the core mental boundary. Um, pressure. But it's nice because from the previous experiment I showed you, it was not clear for really large impact if you can have enough e e chemical equilibration. But I think this is a quite a convincing um, argument to say that yes, you probably, uh, turbulent actually have time to develop because of this secondary impact. Chemically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Why not? If you have enough mixing between the two, it depends. Then it depends on two main time scales: the time scale of the sedimentation of those drops compared to the time scale of mixing uh, during that process. So, uh, if I, I let's say I haven't looked at that in detail yet because I haven't had a very clear argument that it could be important for geochemistry, but if there is some, uh, I'm interested to look at that. Yes. bring them in the lower mental, yes. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah, so um, the idea is, can we say something about the stratification in this layer? Uh, so we measure the characteristic um, length of this layer before t diffusion of composition um, is uh, dominates, basically. So just after the experiment, um, when the, the layer settles. And we get, uh, we normalize the volume by the volume of the release liquid. And um, yes, and basically that's our way to quantify mixing. So what is going to control mixing? So inertia during the spreading is what governs mixing. But in the meantime, 
buoyancy stabilizes the float because this liquid is less than that that one. And so it's really the ratio of those two that is going to dominate mixing. And actually, it's the same as what we saw before. It's a full number by definition. It's a ratio of inertia to buoyancy. And so the inertia is basically dictated by the difference between the release liquid and the upper layer, so this term, and the buoyancy is basically comes from the density difference between the liquid uh, in blue, the release liquid, and the lower layer, so that term. So by definition, it's equal to minus one over n rho, our density difference ratio. And in the experiment, we do find a positive correlation between the volume um, and minus uh, one over n rho. And we again, we find a scaling law um, that fits our, our experimental data. And so again, we have a scaling law that gives you the volume of the layer, of the stratified layer, as a function of the properties of the impactor. So it's quite convenient. And so we can convert it into a regime diagram that will give you the volume of the layer, but this time as a function of the density difference between the impactor core and the protocore, or I should say the density difference between the metal that merges with the protocore and the protocore, and the mass of the impactor. And so below this black line, the volume of the layer, uh, the volume, the final volume of the layer is larger than the volume of the core. That means that the entire core mixes, so it's a mixed core regime. But above this black line, only a portion of the core is entrained with the release liquid and you form a stratified layer at the top of the core. So now if you locate giant impact in this diagram, uh, you find that most giant impact are actually in the layered core regime. So it's very possible to produce stratification after giant impact, uh, stratification in the core. So the other game we can play is to take, although they are very controversial from one study to another, I, I have to say, big disclaimer on that, but if I play the game of taking values that have been suggested by um, seismology, so a layer of 300 kilometers with density difference um, that comes from this paper on Brotold and Badro 2017 that gives um, a range of possible density contrast that will give you a, a lighter layer at the top of the core. Um, and you can locate that, so basically we inject that in our scaling law and uh, we find that we would be here in the di regime diagram, meaning that a layer, um, an impactor of about uh, 20 times smaller than the Earth can produce a this layer observed by the seismology. Um, and so that's quite nice because this is an impactor size which is compatible with some of the moon forming impacts uh, that have been proposed, mainly the Chuck and Stewart uh, model and um, the Mars size the standard my size uh, impactor. So that's it for the, um, this talk. So basically the conclusions are that first, um, lab experiments are very useful to study impact because in their complementary to simulations become they can, they can produce turbulence. Uh, second, the fruit number, which is a ratio between inertia and gravity is the main key param or the key control parameter in those problems. Um, we found that the degree of chemical equilibration uh, due to the impact velocity is three to five times larger than the previous models predicted. Uh, so it would be interesting to see what's, what are those consequences for geochemical data. And the stratified layer observed at the top of Earth's core today could be a vestige of the impacts that formed the moon 4.5 billion years ago. So um, I guess, yeah, the next step, uh, um, yeah, I already mentioned that. So I'm just here because I have a movie, so I like to show movies. So one study we are actually working on right now uh, with colleagues in Cambridge is to do the same game, but to see if we can explain morphology at the surface of, of um, crater morphology at the surface of planets uh, using non-Newtonian liquids, not in Newtonian fluids, sorry. Um, and it's, it, it seems to work quite well, actually. So here you have an impact in a, a yield stress field, and you see that um, you will see eventually that you keep an a crater at the end yep, because it's a yield stress field, so it's solid and there are given stress um, and it behaves as a, a fluid above this stress and you see that uh, after the experiment you, you retain some shape which is a you know the crater morphology so that's what I'm, I'm doing so far yes
That one? That one? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the experiment... Yeah, 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 exactly. And the idea is, can we uh, can we explain those morphologies as a function of the different control points? So yeah, anyway, it, it seems to be uh, quite nice. Yes, exactly. It applies to uh, yeah much smaller um, impacts where the yield stress, or the strength of the material matter. Yeah, and as a conclusion, that's a fluid dynamicist view of the formation of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> there is no planetary science people in the audience, so I can say that, right? Or may I should say the few. <laughs> I won't be dead in the, at the end of the day. Oh, oh merde! <laughs> <laughs> okay, any question on that? No?